Hello. Um, welcome to the 30th anniversary of the MIT 100K. This year is going to see a lot of big changes for the 100K. Uh, we've made it through 30 years by continuing to adapt to the, to the entrepreneurial environment here, and we're going to continue to do so. So keep your eyes open for what's new and what's different this year. But before that, we're here to celebrate some of the best early stage entrepreneurs at MIT, at MIT for this pitch competition. And as always, we wouldn't he be here without the help of a very important group of people. And we want to thank our judges and mentors for they, their time and their help throughout this process to uh, help the teams and provide feedback. This wouldn't be possible without all of you. So please join us in a big hand of, a round of applause for our judges. And next, uh, we want to thank our sponsors as well. So in addition to funding and making all of this happen, our sponsors also opened their doors to the teams and to us, the leadership committee, to provide value wherever and however possible. So to our gold sponsors, Morgan Lewis, Wilmer Hale, Goodwin, Wolf Greenfield, Prudential, and Booz Allen Hamilton, as well as our silver sponsors, Sidan, McCarter and English, and Akamai, Thank you for everything you do to make the 100K possible. So please join me in welcoming our MC for tonight, Dulcie Madden. <laughs> Dulcie is the co-founder and CEO of Rest Devices, a startup that builds personalized AI-driven coaching products for families and healthcare consumers. In partnership with Johnson & Johnson, Rest Devices launched Nod, an app-based software platform delivering customized sleep coaching to parents, now used in more than 40 countries. Rest has also launched and scaled multiple groundbreaking consumer hardware products for monitoring sleep, including the Mimo Baby Sleep Monitor. Dulcie has a BS in biology from Georgetown University and half an MBA from the most prestigious, prestigious school in the universe, MIT Sloan School of Management. She lives That's here in I Boston. Do. What? Just half. It's all you need. Yeah. As a second year, I can attest to it's that. It's true. Um, <laughs> she lives in Boston with her husband and their two young children. Please I take do. it away, Dulcie. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Woo, 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 woo. I think, is this on? Is this on? Can you hear me? Great. Well, all right. Hey, everybody. I am Dulcie, um, and I'm going to be your MC for this evening. Uh, I came to Sloan, as Jake mentioned, because, you know, this place in general, MIT, is the hotbed of innovation and fostering entrepreneurship. And it was indeed so successful that I dropped out and or technically am on indefinite leave after a year. Um, so take that in mind and think about that as you think about the uh, teams today. Um, tonight we're going to hear pitches from 18 finalists. Each team will have 90 seconds to give their pitch, followed by two minutes of Q&A. There will be a timer to keep track of time. And be warned, their buzzer will go off if you go over time, all you teams. And I will have to awkwardly rush you off the stage. I am prepared to do it. For anyone here who has a cell phone, which is all of you, please turn your phones to Do Not Disturb uh, so you don't disrupt the pitches. And if you have to leave, please wait until in between the presentations so you don't disrupt the teams while they're doing their thing. How tonight's actually going to work. So to start the evening, we'll hear from the first nine teams. After that, we're going to take a break. And we will hear from our fabulous keynote speaker, Mac Le Max Lebowski. I don't know where he is. He's around here somewhere. He's kick-ass. Yes, Max. Um, he has a fabulous company, uh, Forum Labs, and he is also a former competitor in the 100K. Um, so he is basically the pinnacle of what we all want to be and are going to try to be. Um, the last nine pitches will follow Max, after which we will dismiss the judges to d deliberate. While that's happening, you all will have the opportunity to cast your vote for the Audience Choice Award. And we're also going to go ahead and invite Max back on stage for some Q&A. The last step before we get to the pitches themselves, the main event, is to introduce our illustrious judges. Here they are. All right, so our judge one over here in the far right corner is Yanathan Stream Amit, who is the co-founder and CEO of Cyber Reason. Yanathan is the CTO and co-founder, and he is a machine learning big data analytics and visualization technology expert with over a decade of experience applying analytics to security in the Israeli Defense Forces and Israeli government agencies. Prior to founding Cyber Reason, Jonathan headed the development for Watchdocs, which is a leading DRM and SaaS security startup. Thank you for being here. Next up, woo, yeah, let's give him a big hand. <laughs> ah. yes. 
Okay, so I skipped some slides, so absorb this really quickly while I go through. Here we go. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, we have Brian Levine, who is the VP of Strategy and Analytics at Mo Mobility. Mobility. Mobiquity, I'm so sorry. Uh, when confronted with a choice of being cast on season two of The Apprentice or starting a company with one of his professors from the MIT Media Lab, Brian chose the second option and lost the chance to tell a few good stories today, which is highly relevant given what's happening literally today. Uh, <laughs> at Interscope, Brian raised $11 million and successfully ran a media analysis firm that counted every major television network amongst its clients. Since selling the company to Nielsen in 2015, what, what, Brian has built and sold a number of smaller digital products for both independently and through Mobiquity, including patent, patented sensor technology for Google and an upcoming new type of smartwatch. That's very exciting. Thank you for being here. All right. Next up, we have the kick-ass Lily Lyman, who is a principal at Underscore VC. There she's an investor, and Underscore invests at the earliest stage in tech companies. Building off her experience in Facebook in mobile and social, Lily helps drive Underscore's trusted cloud intelligence thesis with a specific focus on digital transformation, top of stack SaaS apps, AI ML, machine learning, and security. She also drives the firm's work with academic institutions, which includes managing you first, a program for first time founders. Definitely talk to her, everyone in this room. Yeah. Thanks for being here, Lily. <laughs> Next up, we have Isaac Stoner, who is the COO of Octagon Therapeutics, um, which is a drug development company focused on resistant infections and autoimmune disease. Whoa. He has been in technical leadership roles at a variety of early stage life sciences startups, including Firefly Bioworks, which was acquired in 2014, and Ion Torrent acquired in 2010, and gained venture capital experience at GlaxoSmithKline, Pure Tech Health, and KDT Ventures. Isaac earned an MBA at MIT. Woot woot! and a degree in biomedical engineering at Brown University. Thanks for being here. <laughs> All right. Last but not least, we have Ted Widely, who is a co-founder, president, and C COO of Form Energy in Incorporated. Ted began his career as a US in Army infantry officer. He went on to be co-founder and head of product at Aquion Energy, and then president of McDonough Innovation before co-founding Form Energy, where he is the president and COO. Form Energy is a venture-backed startup commercializing a breakthrough long-duration energy storage technology invented at MIT. That's awesome. Ted holds an MBA from HBS. You know, that little school down the river. Womp <laughs> womp. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and was recognized in 2013 by the World Economic Forum as a young global leader. Pretty kick-ass. Thank you for being here, Ted. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> so thank you judges for being here. We are so excited. We are excited to see who you pick as a winner this evening. Now it's time for the big event. Everyone get excited. We are about to start with our first team. Next up we have Cord. Cord, are you ready? At Cord, we're reinventing home ownership. Now, my parents were able to save and buy a home. They were able to build the wealth to lift themselves into the middle class and beyond. They lived the American dream. I and 26 million millennials just like me don't have that opportunity. We have, on average, over $40,000 in student loan debt, and we pay more than $200,000 on rent before we even think about buying our first home. At the same time, institutional investors who own more than 90% of stocks, bonds, and commercial real estate own less than 2% of the $32 trillion residential real estate market. It's clear the, the, tr the residential uh, real estate model doesn't work for the individual or the investor. Cord does, and that's because we're doing something new. Unlike traditional mortgage lenders, we empower individuals to buy a home over time progressively with equity, not with debt. At the same time, we offer investors broad exposure to price movements in the economy, as well as to a massive pool of low-risk, untapped buyers. We've already pre-qualified close to 400 people who are ready to buy a home through our service, and we're in the middle of finalizing the financing on the purchase of our first home. We have a strong team. With over 30 years of combined experience in real estate investment banking, corporate and securities law, housing policy, and design, and a board with decades more of relevant experience. 
We are unlocking the wealth that was available to our parents. We are enabling investors to realize a profit while being a partner with homeowners. At Cord, we are reinventing home ownership and reclaiming the American dream because you should own your home on your terms. Thank you. This is my team. This is Michael and this is Sam. Hi. <laughs> so, so now is the Q&A. So how does it work? <laughs> yeah, what you do that? Uh, that's a very long conversation, but we'd be happy to have it with you. Um, may maybe not in this setting, but uh, it's the consumer enters into an agreement. Uh, we have a legal agreement, which is it's a joint venture between the, uh, the, the company and the consumer where they staircase, they buy an uh, additional piece of equity over time. The company buys the bulk of the property. There's a very small down payment. There is uh, an allocation of, of risks and an allocation of benefits. Over time, as the consumer buys more and more equity, their usage fee for the renting the property goes down. So kind of gross oversimplification, but rent to own kind of a thing? The it's difference, I would say, I would say the difference between rent to own and our model is with rent to own, you don't have equity on day one. You're paying rent for three years, five years, and at the end of that period, there's a capital event that's triggered at which some portion of your rent is converted into your down payment. So if anything happens within those three to five years and you have to leave, you don't have any equity that's left over. With our model, you're only buying equity um, with every payment that you make every month. So uh, if, if something happens at the end of three years, you'll still have three years of equity built up that can accrue to your bank account. Do you create a separate vehicle to purchase the homes? Yes, we do. Uh, yes, we do. We're, uh, we're creating, uh, right now, the model that we're investigating is a real estate investment trust. The real estate investment trust is going to be a Maryland business trust that's securitized. Um, we're looking at um, most likely a Regulation D offering, but ultimately we're going to uh, partner with capital markets to uh, have traditional um, capital markets fund the actual acquisition, fund the different vehicles. So how did the economics end up looking for you guys? How does this compare to like a standard home lender? Are you saying for us or for the home you, owner? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for you, your, for your business. For, for the consumer or for the investor, I'm sorry? For, 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 for your business. Oh, uh, for us as a company, we, uh, so we do have a separate business than the model itself, so, or the fund itself. So the fund, the fund has one return profile and the company has a different return profile. Our return profile, it's origination fees, and then it's partial spread management. Thank you. Thank you, Cord. Great job. All right. Next up, we have Yemis Technologies. Come on out, you guys. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. This is a chicken, <laughs> and every year, 58 billion of these birds are raised from meat consumption. And in the process, $6 billion is lost through inefficient and suboptimal management of the farm environment. In this low margin industry, chicken feed accounts for 70% of the cost of a bird, and a suboptimal environment results in wasteful consumption of feed. Our conversations with global producers such as Cargo have revealed that a lack of data and tools to monitor the environment in the poultry shed represent a key problem. So at Yamas, we're developing a robotics and AI-enabled solution to detect changes in the key environmental variables. This includes ammonia, CO2, humidity, light, and temperature of the bird. What's more, our robot is equipped with biometric sensors to detect changes in the bird's weight, a key variable in feed allocation decisions. And by improving data visibility, in the case of a producer such as Tyson, that grew my friend over here, this can unlock almost $200 million in savings. Now our team brings over 10 years of entrepreneurial experience, including backgrounds at organizations such as Harvard, MIT, and Google. But more importantly, we've secured our first customer, a poultry producer with over 100 years of industry experience that has given us $200,000 in angel investment and 300 farms on which to prototype our solution. We hope that your vote can give us a boost and help the chickens roost.
how big is this market? So we estimate that the entire market size is about $10 billion. So that's coming from um, feed conversion ratio improvement, which is the first thing that I mentioned, uh, reduction in labor, and reduction in vaccine that's used to uh, moderate temperature and issues that are coming from the environment at the moment. And how much does it cost you to deliver uh, you know, a dollar of savings to a poultry producer? So you mean in terms of like the con construction of our product to be able to do that? So, we, I mean, in fact, to produce this is costing about $4,000 to us. And how many dollars of savings might that save me if I was a chicken producer over a year? So if we estimate a producer like Tyson, which is producing maybe two billion birds at a dollar a bird, uh, we're estimating that we can save them 10 cents, so 10% on the feed conversion ratio, which is coming in at 200 million. With one? Uh, so that would be, uh, you would need one effectively in each of their barns, and they will have approximately uh, 30,000 barns. So if you have a customer, you presumably have a prototype or a product that's ready to go? Yeah, so we have this, which is, this is the other prototype, but the first one is in Ireland, and the other one is in the Philippines, so we're in 300 barns in Ireland, and by Christmas we'll be in 1,500 barns in the Philippines, and for uh, sake of scale, I I've mentioned Tyson, uh, they're at about 10,000 barns, so that's sort of a, an indication of what we're hoping to reach as we improve this solution. And I think the key thing is, as you can imagine, mobility is the challenge, and being able to work on a farm environment and actually refine and test that solution is a really key advantage uh, to us. When, when the, uh, so this is predominantly judging, is using sensors to determine the environment and how yeah, the environment exactly. is changing the chicken response to it. So is it adjusting like when the feed is delivered or what's the Yeah, exactly. Um, so at the moment, if you can imagine on a farm, it's effectively there's just one thermometer. It's not very advanced. It's a bit of a traditional industry. The idea is by having this move around more dynamically and sense that you can feed the data back to a system whereby the farmers can make more educated decisions in terms of how they allocate the feed. Um, farm decisions um, are ultimately made in terms of feed conversion ratio, and by being able to improve that, we can add significant how, how do you compute that? Amount sorry, of sorry, we gotta, we gotta wrap it up. <laughs> Thank you, way to go, Yemis. All right, next up, we have Instacam Inc. Come on out. Hi, everyone. Hi everyone, I'm Raymond, founder of Instacam. By show of hands, how many of you own a smartphone? <laughs> hey, some of you over there must be still using your flip phones. I'm gonna make a claim that right here, right now, all of you could be making money with just your smartphone. Too good to be true? Well, my best friend Mark from California wishes he was at the 100K pitch event and see me live on stage. Problem is, there's no easy way to see a specific location on demand. Good news is any of you with a smartphone could live video stream it to him and he'd be more than willing to pay you a fee for your services. You make money, Mark gets what he wants and everyone's happy. Instacam is a mobile app that lets users request an on-demand live video stream from another user by location in real time. It's connecting the world by video in a massive $80 billion market. Instacam is event and location based. This means you don't need to know or be friends with the streamer on the other end. Also, during the stream, you use intuitive gesture controls to control the streamer, so just like you're there. Our business model is really simple. We take a 10% cut of each transaction. Our team has been working hard, and we want to make MIT the first college campus to be accessible 24-7 through a live video stream. Stay tuned, because we're launching in two weeks. Thank you, everyone. So what's an example of a request that somebody might make for a video? So I can, my name is Vivian, I'm a co-founder of Instacam. I can give you some examples. Um, so a lot of us are Sloanies here. A couple weeks ago, we had a Sloan Olympics game. And after the game, we really wanted to go hang out at a bar, and, but there were a huge group of us. So we ended up walking around, wandering, wasting 40 minutes in the North End area, and went, ended up going to three bars physically, and eventually we found a bar that could accommodate a huge group of people like us, and also had the TVs we wanted, the environment, the music that we also wanted. So if we could have Instacam of the app that we can pull up, just like Uber, we could you know, drop the 
bar location that we want to check, and then some streamer around that bar who's you know just chilling or whatever, they'll pick up the request and then stream it for 10, 20 seconds for us. They get paid, and at the same time, we'll see whatever we want to see, um, and we can make a decision faster and without wasting 40 minutes and walking around. So what's the user experience for both the, the person requesting the video and then the pr person producing the video? What do you envision the, the, the overall experience? The user experience will be um, flawless and protects um, the privacy. So that you can't <laughs> see the, so the streamer can't see you, but you could direct the streamer with gestures. Like you draw an arrow, turn to the right, the streamer will get that direction on their screen, they will turn to the right. So you don't need to talk to them. You could talk to them if you want, but it's optional. So we want to make the experience seamless and comfortable for all people. Are there privacy concerns for like everybody else that the streamer is recording? <laughs> well, uh, that's the same privacy concern as taking pictures or using camera, right? You, if I sell you a camera, I'm not responsible for what you're taking pictures of. Yeah, but if it's you're coming through your money. servers, is that? Right. That doesn't um, open you up for anything? There, there will be a user agreement. They would sign it so they don't need, they can't like take pictures of, um, of like illegal things. But if, if, the, uh, if the person that's selling the stream is videoing people and making money off of their image and sharing their video, is there no legal issue around that? Uh, there's currently nothing that we identified. I mean, it's, the responsibility is on the user. Thanks, guys. Amazing. All right, thank you. Next up, we have Riapto. Come on out. Let's give it up. Oh, yes, thank you, Scott. Most of us enjoy the convenience of owning our own car, but private cars are an unsustainable means of transportation. They're cluttering up our streets, they cause too much pollution, and they're idle most of the time. Uh, companies, ride sharing is the solution. Ride sharing is the solution where multiple passengers can share the same vehicle. Uber and Lyft and other companies that presented themselves as a de facto product for these services, yet research shows they only add more vehicles to the road. This is because routing for ride sharing is extremely difficult and they don't do it very well. This causes more congestion, higher waiting times, and higher prices. At Riopto, our team has developed the world's most advanced shared vehicle routing solution. With a fifth of the vehicles, we're able to service all of Manhattan's taxi demand with a delay of three minutes. This reduces carbon emissions by 80% and saves $54 million on fuel costs alone per year. And this is only for Manhattan. Our algorithm uses large-scale optimization techniques, runs in the cloud, and allows third-party companies to use Riopto as their routing provider. Our team consists of myself, a PhD student working on ride-sharing algorithms for the past three years, a, uh, a, tech, a transportation software engineer, and two professors. With our, uh, with our team, we believe that we can have cleaner air, faster, happier, safer travel, and uh, less congestion on the roads, all by changing the way we route our vehicles. Thank you very much. When you say better, how much better is yours than what exists today? Is there a particular figure of merit that you could uh, reference? So if we just look at the number of vehicles that are actually uh, being routed in, in Manhattan, just the taxis, that's the open data set at the moment, we're able to reduce the number of taxis by 77% just by more intelligently routing the vehicles that pick up and deliver these passengers. And we do it with a very low uh, inconvenience to the passenger by making them wait for less than one minute and having an induced travel delay of less than three minutes. How does this integrate into the workflow of some of the existing uh, mobility providers like an Uber or a so we're looking to market to companies that are doing pickup and delivery problems. So this could be Uber and Lyft, but this could also be taxi companies or food delivery companies such as uh, Grubhub or Instacart. Any type of pickup and delivery problem where you have extremely critical time constraints, our algorithm can be used to find routes very, very effectively. How do you price it? So we have two different pricing models. One is just routing per request, like how Google does. And we can see that companies are willing to pay for that since Uber did use Google as their routing provider for a long time. Or we could do uh, route, uh, fleet efficiency consulting, where we actually work with companies to improve the efficiency of their fleet and improve the distribution of their vehicles. So route, route optimization, you mentioned taxis as a service, but route optimization basically implies the shared, shared rides. Otherwise, 
the optimized, yes, it, it optimized it call, so it's not really matching the classical taxi service. Mm -hmm. and it very much sounds like the Via, the company called Via Story, which basically does the same thing in Manhattan mm -hmm. right now. How do you differentiate yourself in that situation? So we believe that our tech is better than what exists out there on the market. So we have a paper published in PNAS and the following pa subsequent papers on fleet optimization, where we show that we're actually able to drastically uh, Im improve the fleet size to service all of the demand. Uh, just because there's a lot of constraints that are involved in actually planning these routes that you end up with some people who are just unable to be serviced in a reasonable amount of time. And we're able to fix that. Have you done any customer conversations that prove that people would be willing to switch for this incremental benefit that you're adding? Uh, so no, we're currently looking at, uh, we're currently developing market research and talking to companies about how exactly our routing solution can be applied to solve their problems. Thank All you. right, thank you so much. All right, next up we have Veleron. Come on out. How are we going to feed ourselves in the future? We say shrimp. Aquaculture is an efficient and low carbon way to produce protein. Starting in 2014, we get more of our seafood from farming than fishing. Over each year, over $40 billion of shrimp are produced worldwide. Yet, current shrimp farming practices are not sustainable. They have just damaged environments, including mangroves in Southeast Asia. They are a cause of modern slavery. And many shrimp are plagued with disease, with over 40% of shrimp worldwide dying before harvest. At Velarone, we are working to solve these problems by monitoring online and in real time the water quality across all of the shrimp ponds on a shrimp farm. We have developed a system of interconnected sensors that measure water temperature, dissolved oxygen, acidity, and other aspects of water quality to alert the farmer when there is a problem so that they can take action. Um, in addition, we plan to sell predictive analytics to farmers via a monthly app service, which allows them to de-risk their operation, reducing mortality, and increasing yield. To me, the most exciting part of this is, with all the data that we would collect on operations, we will be able to incentivize farmers to use sustainable practices via premium products that customers could support, sort of like fair trade coffee. With the MIT 100K, we plan to launch a pilot in Mexico and measure our impact both on the environment and on the economics for underserved shrimp farmers. Thank you. Could you give us an example of sort of what you think it would cost the farmer and how much you think you would save them? So the manufacturer cost for the sensors is about $1,500. Typical shrimp pond's about 20 acres. So the install cost for a farm with, say, 20 shrimp ponds would be 30 grand. Um, I mean, I think once we've had it installed, the predictive analytics would be not too expensive, especially if we had enough scale. So let's suppose it costs a farmer $1,000 a year once it was installed. They have 40% death loss right now on average for their shrimp. So you're looking at, I mean, tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars per year they could save. How do you differentiate from existing sensors that are out there? Like what makes you differentiated? So right now, sensors are typically just measuring one thing. And typically, the data has to be collected by hand. So you have farmers going, or farmers or farm workers going out to the ponds even in the middle of the night to collect the data. And there's no real alerting system. So we see a lot of farmers say, I just can't sleep at night when I know that there might be an oxygen level drop in my pond and I might lose all the shrimp in it. So how, how is the farmer able to respond to your data and actually make a fact, generate value up? I have 80% death and now I know about it in advance that tomorrow is gonna be a catastrophe. How do I react? So I, so I think the quick win, a great question. I think the quick win is right now they have circulators in their ponds. These circulators take a lot of energy but they also raise the oxygen level. So during the day when the sun's out and your plankton are photosynthesizing, you have plenty of oxygen. At night, you may or may not need to turn on your circulators. This app will tell you if you have too low of oxygen, go out there and turn that on. In the long run, once we've collected enough data across a lot of farms, we want to develop algorithms to predict factors that would lead to disease. So farmers could take other actions like correct the pH or even look at things like temperature or uh, other nutrient contents. And I, I just want that sounds great. I, I want to be clear on the earlier piece, though, that uh, 
you don't have any sense of the value creation, like what this could save or what, how they can benefit monetarily? So big picture, $40 billion of shrimp in the world, 40% of shrimp die before harvest. So that's about $16 billion. We need to measure what percentage of that we can actually save, but the potential is huge. Great, thank you. Thanks. All right, next up we have Insulet Energy. Come on out. Solar energy is a hot field right now, but solar panels just aren't cool enough. And by that, I'm referring to temperature. You see, as the $17 billion solar panel industry is keenly aware, as panel operating temperatures rise, efficiency drops, making solar energy an increasingly expensive proposition. That's why at Insulate Energy, we've developed novel passive cooling technology that allows our customers to operate their photovoltaic systems at full potential. Our technology leverages nature's natural diurnal temperature variations to drive a phase change process. And because our system is both compact and modular, it can easily be installed on existing solar panel setups. See, unlike existing capital intensive cooling options like active water circulation, our system is entirely passive, meaning zero energy or resource expenditure after the initial installation. We've already developed a full scale prototype and tested it uh, alongside computational simulations across the United States. And our results show that we can deliver a 10 to 20% increase in electricity generation for less than 10% of the installed price of the panel. At Insulate Energy, we're planning to first target uh, homeowners with previously installed solar, um, solar panels and then move on to full scale solar farms. And we believe that with this technology, solar energy can finally be made affordable. Thank you. So the math went by a little fast for the Harvard yeah. guy. Maybe you could go over that again. <laughs> um, what's, the, what's the adjusted dollars per watt of the solar panel relative to a standard solar panel? All right, so for a for standard solar panel, uh, say 100 watts, like a three foot by four, uh, four foot kind of thing, uh, the installed cost is around $320. So what we're saying is that we can sell you our device for 10% of that cost, and you can recover it uh, within a year, and that's the worst case scenario. Sorry, 10% of the cost of the install? Uh, cost of the, the, the panel plus its installation. Okay. So the panel itself is only around $120. So the installation is actually more expensive. So again, 40 bucks or something for your device. Yeah, and, and the great thing is that's a one-time cost, right? But you keep getting these efficiency gains day after day, year, year after year. And actually, if you look at the literature uh, with uh, the, the specific material we're using, uh, people have done this for like, uh, cycled it for five years worth of cycles, and its thermal properties stay intact. Is your buyer is the buyer of the solar panels who are retrofitting? Yeah, so, so ultimately um, <laughs> what it's very hard to do is with these large scale solar farms, nobody wants to be your first customer. They always want to be your second customer because they need so, to see it in action before, even if you have data. So that's why we think homeowners who are doing this at a much smaller scale and therefore it's a much smaller investment will be uh, the first place that we want to start selling to. And so you're going to have to build your own sales force to go and remarket to all of these people <laughs> for this additional sale? Um, yeah, well, it's, it's essentially the same product, right? Because um, either way, uh, both of our customers want exactly the same thing, which is just increased electricity generation. How are you gonna make these things? Uh, so the manufacturing is actually pretty simple. It's inside a, an aluminum pouch, almost think of it as like a Capri Sun pouch, and you fill it with the phase change material, which is um, a salt hydrate, and so you basically put this inside these pouches, and they're, uh, again, fairly easily, easily manufactured. What's your next step? Uh, so our next step is basically um, optimizing the manufacturing and then also looking at specifically how are we gonna go out and sell the product. What, what does it cost you to produce oh. it? Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Ready to go, insulate. That was great. All right. Next up, Cogentis Therapeutics. Here we go. Alzheimer's. One in three of us are predicted to get Alzheimer's disease by the age of 85. Why, after hundreds of clinical trials, do we still have no cure? Trials of the past were limited due to toxicity, or by the fact that they only targeted a singular hallmark of the disease, 
The three major hallmarks are the plaques, tangles, and inflammation you may have heard of. At Cogentis Therapeutic, we are a team of scientists, clinicians, and um, industry leaders who are uniquely poised to develop a cure for Alzheimer's. In collaboration with our advisors at NIH and right here at MIT, who discovered a new early target for Alzheimer's, we developed CT526, our lead patent-protected drug. In mice with Alzheimer's, we saw that this drug decreased not one, but all three of the major hallmarks. More importantly, the memory and the behavior of these mice was restored to that of healthy mice. To top this all off, our drug was non-toxic, even if you loaded them up with 100 times the therapeutic dose. With your help, along with our exclusive license to develop the drug, we'll raise $3 million in order to de-risk and prepare our drug for clinical trials within two years. It's after this that we plan on partnering with Pharma, allowing our investors to exit, in which companies like ours have been worth anywhere from a half a billion to a billion dollars. We are Cogentis Therapeutics, and together we can change the experience of aging. Thank you. So Alzheimer's is pretty much the hardest therapeutic area of all the therapeutic areas, even worse than resistant bacteria. Um, do you think you can succeed where all of Big Pharma has failed on, on $3 million to get yourself into the clinic? So we think that we can do the, the necessary pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic characterization um, in order to build our confidence um, to get to the point where we can file for IND um, with $3 million. Um, we are going to repeat some of the academic data we have um, in order to revalidate that in a very controlled uh, clinical, clinical research organization. Um, but um, yes, we think with $3 million we can get to IND. Okay, so these are huge, um, long clinical trials as well, so hundreds and hundreds of patients over a decade or decades. Yep. Uh, how, how much cash all in is it going to take you to get to that half billion dollar exit? So. There's multiple different exit stages that we can, um, that we're planning on. One, um, companies similar to ours um, have exited at the preclinical stage. Um, if we decide to go further, we may have to do a series A round to get us through phase one or phase two of approximately $10 million. Um, but we at Cogentis Therapeutics, we're not in the business of running phase, big phase two, phase three clinical trials. Um, so our, our eventual goal is to partner with a larger pharma pharmaceutical company who has the resources necessary to run these trials. Has anybody on the team successfully gone through this process before? Yes, so our advisors, um, we have um, Dr. AJ Verma, at, um, he's currently the CMO at um, United Neurosciences. He was the VP at Biogen um, and he supervised the aducanumab trials. Um, for Alzheimer's disease through phase one through phase three. Um, we um, also have um, substantial, um, our CEO is an MD, PhD at Johns Hopkins um, uh, with over 17 years of experiment, experience. And we also have um, Dr. Sanjeev Tohan, um, who got special um, permission from Novartis, who has over 20 years of industry experience in uh, preclinical um, safety and toxicology, and he's seen over 27 um, therapeutics uh, to file for IND. Great. So yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. All right. Two left to go from the first nine. Come on up, Waters of Life. By the end of this pitch, five children will have died from contaminated drinking water. Conducting water quality testing is a logistical nightmare. A trained technician has to travel to a distant site, collect water samples to test, and then bring them back to the lab for testing. Communities simply do not have the resources that they need to continuously undergo this cost and time intensive process. And when water is not tested and treated as frequently as it needs to be, people pay with their lives. Two million people die every year from waterborne illness. 
So in order to address this, Waters of Life has created a crowdsourcing platform, which allows communities to test, treat, and report contaminated water sources in the area, all without any technical knowledge. The first step is the use of our water quality testing stickers, which cost less than one cent each and change color for easy contaminant identification. When users identify contaminated water sources, they can then report them on our mobile app to get information about how to treat their water and to see other reports of contamination in their community. We then aggregate all of this data and sell it to governments and NGOs, giving them access to real-time water quality data. They can use this data to prevent the spread of outbreaks via water and also to identify high-priority water quality issues to address. They can also significantly save on their water quality testing costs by as much as 20 times the cost of traditional water testing. We are currently developing our minimum viable product for testing in Brazil this summer. We're Waters of Life and we're saving lives through real-time water quality data. Thank you. How do you incentivize users to engage to actually test the water? Um, so when I traveled to northeastern Brazil this um, past summer, I did a lot of working with the users. And like fear, particularly among parents of young children, was that their kids were going and using contaminated public water sources. So parents are incentivized just from like a fear and a health perspective for their kids to give them these sensing stickers. And then they're incentivized to report them onto the app because they get data on how to purify the water. And there's also a community effect of the more people who input data into this model, the more they're able to see contaminated water sources in their area. How many participants do you need in order to have a, a data set that you can leverage and sell to those larger organizations? Yeah. Um, so typically, it, like, it largely depends on like where it is. Like currently in northeastern Brazil, which is where we are targeting it, they only collect close to like 100 test points per year. So you know, I think we could leverage so much more than that with individual users crowdsourcing their data. But I think anything larger than what they existing have is currently have is a benefit for them. So do, you, do these these are going to be developing world communities? Yeah. Much. So um, do they have access to the the phone network, mobile network, or or hardware in order to report yeah. this data in a meaningful way? So we think refugee camps are actually going to be like the biggest market for this technology. So 95% of the refugees in Syria, for example, have access to mobile phones. A much smaller percentage of them have access to clean and safe drinking water. So we think that's going to be a really big market where they have mobile access but not water access. And so the, to make money, it's not off of selling the individual kids. No. So it's off of, so how much will right. folks pay for this data? Um, so, uh, w assuming like that only one in a hundred people who use our testing product actually report it to the data, we estimate about a 20 times reduction in cost compared to tr traditional models. So I think some kind of like a cost sharing whereas they see a reduction in their water testing cost and we take a portion of that. Great. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Last but not least, from our first nine, we have Pri Kavita. Are you ready? Come on up. In Brazil, 75% of the population doesn't have access to health insurance. People wait up to six months to, to, have, their, to have their disease diagnostic, and they can't afford, people can't afford to pay for private health insurance. On the other side, doctors in Brazil have received a very low rate in the public health system and also need the right guidance in their decision-making process. We are Precavida. Precavida is a matching platform to connect doctors with the patients and provide a one-stop shop platform for healthcare services. We are powered by AI and a concert services. My name is Laís Fonseca and I have been working on this problem for five years. I develop and have been operating an offline matching system that currently serves 100,000 patients and has the, the more than 110 doctors in our database. We are target the out-of-pocket market for healthcare services, which represents $5.2 billion in, in revenues in Brazil. At MIT, I would like to develop a scalable solution to help more than 100,000 patients in Brazil that, that need access to quality, timely, and affordable healthcare. 
Thank you. What's the revenue model? How do you make money? Yeah. So we have like a win-win price strategy. So we have the doctors, they receive 40% um, uh, more than the private insurance companies and the patients pay 60% less. You're essentially building a marketplace, so you have to go yeah. after both sides of it. Can you talk a little bit about your go-to-market, both on the patient side and on the doctor yeah. side? Yes. So our main strategy for go to markets is to do partnerships through doctors. So we already have a network in a specific region. We operate already operating in a specific region in Brazil. And we would like to go to partnerships with some uh, providers and make sure that um, they are on board. So it's like through referrals and through um, some connections they already have in the network for doctor side. For the patient side, it's more around how to, we can expand uh, their user base, uh, most, most with referrals, connections, and, um, and Facebook, and uh, more, a lot of uh, digital marketing strategies. Yeah. Well, Actually, uh, the country really uh, likes uh, public health care yep. services, and uh, it's really a matching platform to match demanded supply, optimize demanded supply on both sides. Yep. How does it work now? So now people go, so it's a walk-in, walk people go to a place and they are matched uh, through the, all the network that we have. So people talk to a personal assistant, the person, a real person, and that's, why, that's the part that we are trying to uh, optimize. So Sorry, I meant how does it work without your service? So the, what's the pre-existing system? Sorry, there's a question. That you built. Uh, no, before you guys existed, how all do people right. find the doctor? Okay, so people normally, they go to the public, public system, they wait six months for one appointment. Uh, if they don't find this doctor, they pay out of pocket, very expensive, around uh, $120 per appointment. Usually the way to find doctors in Brazil is through the healthcare uh, insurance companies. So if you don't have a private insurance, you have to get referrals. So, and, but you know, as your targeted people that uh, are not able to pay for the private health insurance, so they just have a hard time in finding uh, the right service. Yep. All right, thank you. Thank you, Prey Kavita. All right, before we move on to our keynote speaker, anyone who is waiting in the wings or outside, if you guys wanna come on in and take a seat, let's just take a minute to have you guys get actually seated if you would like to. Yeah, I know. <laughs> All right. Let's wrap this up. Yeah. Okay, here we go. We could bring it back down. We need to keep things rolling. All right. Next up. Hey, -oh. Yeah, please have a seat. Thank you. And or mainline it out the door. We gotta keep this moving. As much as I love mobility. Thank you, everyone. All right, so next up. We have the wonderful Max Lebowski. Um, Max is a co-founder and is the CEO of Formlabs. Formlabs pioneered the new category of professional desktop 3D printing in 2012 when it launched the world's first affordable, powerful desktop stereolithography 3D printer. It is awesome. If you haven't used one, try to use one today. Um, I can attest to that. Prior to starting Formlabs, Max led the efforts at Fab at Home, one of the industry's earliest open source 3D printing projects, which has been instrumental to setting up labs and schools worldwide. A Forbes 30 under 30 recipient and World Economic Forum pioneer, Max holds a BS in Applied Engineering and Physics from Cornell University and an MS in Media Arts and Sciences from MIT. Let's give a warm round of applause for Max. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Alrighty, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a little bit about what Formlabs does, and then also sprinkle in some thoughts about uh, how to build a successful tech company. Um, just kind of some some nice tidbits. So I'll start with um, 
my sort of simple recipe for how you build a valuable company uh, that I think applies to pretty much whatever, any, anything anyone does here. Um, number one, you need money. Uh, <laughs> that's what the, you know, the focus of this event uh, here today is, you know, it's about. Um, number two, you need something worth working on. And number three, you need great people to do that. Um, and uh, I think the, the, the reason I'm putting up here, this up here is m you guys are really focused on number one right now. And, um, and that probably seems like the biggest hurdle. If we just get some money, we can get going. Uh, but especially nowadays, if you have an MIT or Harvard background and with the current kind of like funding state, it's raising money is not the hardest thing. In fact, I think these are like increasing order of difficulty. Um, so I'd encourage you to start thinking about the other things as much as you can. Um, and uh, as I talk about form labs, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how, how those things work together. Um, so form labs, what do we do? Uh, we make reliable, accessible 3D printing systems for professionals. Um, I'll go into kind of where we got started, but first just you know, what, what are we doing today and why does it matter? Um, so there are a bunch of types of 3D printers out there. For most of the history of 3D printing, there's been like big expensive machines that have been powerful but difficult to use and not widely available. Um, actually, how many of you have seen one of our printers maybe around campus? Uh, okay, decent number. They're the ones with the orange covers. They're pretty distinctive. Um, and so that's what we kind of set out to do, is get 3D printing to more people. Um, and so before we got started, uh, they're really, you know, if I asked the same question of how many people had uh, even seen a 3D printer before in the same room, it would have been a lot less. Uh, and there were already some desktop machines when we got started, but they weren't targeting professional users. So that's sort of the unique thing that we added is the first professional desktop system. Um, we use a technology called stereolithography. There's a number of types of 3D printing processes, but stereolithography uses uh, lasers and liquid photopolymers to make really high resolution parts. Uh, so we were also the first company to bring this technology to the desktop. Before that, it had been in only the most expensive 3D printers. Um, and fast forward to today, uh, we've shipped about 45,000 printers worldwide. We're shipping more professional 3D printers than all other companies combined. Uh, and our companies have printed tens of millions of parts with them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and so just sort of by the numbers, Form Labs today, we're about 500 people worldwide, uh, biggest chunk in Boston, but we've got a number of offices around the world, including a big office in Berlin for sales and marketing in Europe. We make our products um, in a few different locations uh, in the world, in Hungary, in the US, in Ohio, and in China, in Guangdong area. Um, about 150 people across all types of engineering. Uh, one of the unique things about 3D printing is just the, the breadth of technology development required. It's every type of software from low level embedded to web systems, hardware, electrical, mechanical, precision kind of uh, hardware design, uh, materials. So we formulate our own materials uh, and that, that's a big part of the business as well. Um, uh, shipping in most of the countries that are buying 3D printers. And um, the thing that you know most proud of is we're uh, at about 100 million revenue run rate, and uh, I won't say profitable, but break even. Uh, so we basically fund what we do with, with by selling things rather than spending other people's money. <laughs> I'll take you. Woo. Um, so where are we going in the future? That sort of brings us up to today. So there's a few, few different directions. Um, one is to bring another 3D printing technology uh, to many more people. Uh, so that's a technology called SLS, or Selective Laser Centering. Uh, today, these machines typically, a uh, full installation starts at $200,000. You usually have a whole room dedicated to it. So they're really difficult to use, but they're really powerful, make, um, get you kind of excellent material properties that you can't get with other types of 3D printers. So we're going to uh, do what we did to stereolithography technology to SLS and make it far more accessible, bring it down to something like a $20,000 price point and make it easier to use. Um, that's one, one big direction. 
And uh, yeah, this is SLS process, works with powdered plastics rather than photopolymers. Um, and one of the really nice parts of this uh, process is that the, the parts are supported in the bed of powder, so there's no support structures when you remove a uh, part. Any of you who have actually used a 3D printer will know that the post-processing is often a big part of the time that goes into using a 3D printer. Um, and, so, and another piece of the kind of future direction for the company is um, pushing 3D printing into more high volume applications. And um, when I get into where we came from, this is, this is really uh, um, one of the first places where we're kind of differing from the core focus we've had for the, the last seven years of making 3D printing more accessible. Uh, now we're talking about making 3D printing competitive for higher volume uh, production. And we think we have a really interesting solution there because we're starting from the highest volume manufactured 3D printer in the world or professional 3D printer in the world. And so we have, uh, we have a scale we can bring to this problem and we can, um, uh, we think building up basically farms of printers with many small printers gives you a lot of the benefits that you see um, uh, in computing of using many small servers to kind of break up a problem, better costs overall, better reliability and efficiency. Um, and we're building automation around this as well. So we've got something called Form Cell, which is a big cabinet of Form 2s with a robotic gantry system that runs the printers for you. So there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle to make 3D printing more relevant for high volume production. A um, couple of the early uh, projects we have in, uh, so, sorry, before I get to that, um, so what, what is it going to look like as the uh, S3D printing becomes more relevant for high volume production? We kind of think about this curve of if you took all the parts in the world um, made with uh, all kinds of different processes for different reasons, um, some of them make sense to produce with an expensive process uh, because they're high volume parts and you want to pay for them to be customized or something like that, so like prototyping, uh, or parts that are used in the factory to produce other parts, tools and fixtures and jigs. And those are the applications that have already been done with 3D printing. Um, as we bring the cost point down, more applications will make sense with 3D printing. And so like some of the things we're working on today are dental applications. Um, and as we push the cost further down, I think we'll start to see more mass consumer uh, applications start to happen. Um, so one of, the, uh, one of the examples of that we just announced a couple of weeks ago is a um, partnership with Gillette where they're actually shipping uh, mass customized uh, razor handles that are printed with our printer. You can go on the website, they have this kind of customizer tool where you can choose a design, appearance, uh, and also add um, text to personalize your product. Order it online today. Um, I think it's called Razor Maker, Gillette Razor Maker, if you want to try it out. Um, and then uh, we have another, um, another really interesting project with New Balance, where uh, New Balance wants to uh, print parts of shoes in production uh, with 3D printing. So th this is showing athletic cleats where the plates are printed, uh, and then the other part of the project is midsoles. So that's kind of like the main bottom part of, uh, of running shoes and sneakers and other, other types of shoes. Um, so this is something that requires a really aggressive cost target with 3D printing, something that uh, no one's really reached today, and also really advanced materials. So these are some of the kind of future directions for the company. Um, so uh, now, given where we are today and what you've seen, I want to show you um, some, some parts of our, uh, I think it's the pitch deck we used when we submitted to the 100K competition. I'm not sure which version it is exactly, but uh, I dug it up. And um, I'm going to show it quickly, but mainly what I want to show is like what's the same and what's different uh, from today. And I'll tell you up front that I'm, I'm really proud of how much is similar. Um, and that's, that's one of the points I want to to make. Um, so this was uh, 
Yeah, this was the opening slide. One thing that's funny is these sample parts, which like at the time were unbelievable that we made with a desktop system, are just like horrible compared to what we can produce today. <laughs> <laughs> um, on the other hand, we're still showcasing the same Rook part, and no one's found a, found a better one to show off. But, um, so, uh, so this is how, sort of how we open with, um, I cut out some slides just to, to highlight some stuff, but this is how we explained like, what the market opportunity was. So um, when we were getting started, by far the majority of the market was the high-end machines. There were starting to be some desktop machines, and we sort of said there's this gap where these, these low-end machines are purely for hobbyists. They don't really have any other application, um, but the high-end machines are still really difficult to use and expensive. Uh, so we want to... Uh, Fill the thing, you know, fill that gap with a new product. Um, this was one of the earliest industrial design mock-ups. I'm kind of amazed that we ever thought we could put that in the slide deck, but <laughs> um, it does have the orange cover though, which is actually functional. Uh, and so we were, um, we, I think we, we understood that there's this opportunity in the middle, and. We did use the word consumer here, although that pretty quickly dropped off of our pitch decks. And here we kind of go into more detail about who we thought would buy it. Um, so we, talk, we do talk about hobbyists, um, but then we're looking more at architects and designers, and by secondary printers we mean um, printers that are used by big companies next to the, the big expensive ones they already have in education. So we were um, fairly well focused on uh, applications where people are actually using the parts that come out of a printer rather than just playing with the printer. Um, so we generally got that right, although you, today we wouldn't you know, put hobbyist on there at all. Uh, this is the timeline for what we were going to do. Um, of course, everything took longer than we expected, but not, not uh, as much longer as, <laughs> as you might think. From the point we closed, funding in sort of beginning of 2012. We launched, we announced a product in nine months later and we're shipping it in like 15 months. Um, so it wasn't too far off. Uh, although it turned out the product, first product we shipped was really far from performing as well as we'd, we want, but we, we sold many of them and built the company with that. Um, so, and then this is, um, uh, this is how much money we wanted to raise in the beginning. Uh, we ended up raising 1.8 million in our first round of funding, um, but actually by the time we got to our launch of the product where we took $3 million in pre-orders, uh, we had only spent 800,000, so we, this might have been uh, reasonably, it wasn't, wasn't too far off. Um, but another thing is we were talking about using Kickstarter uh, to take pre-orders to fund the product, and that was a pretty important part of the strategy early on um, and helped us get a lot further with a small amount of money than we would have otherwise. Uh, so the, the big message uh, I'm trying to, to show here is that um, it, if you can, to the extent that you can get the plan right the first time and go straight towards something, it, it makes a huge impact in how quickly you can make uh, progress with the company. Um, and so you hear a lot about pivoting, and I think there's this kind of environment of like, let's try a lot of different things, let's raise some money, let's go and, and do things and learn and go from there. Um, but I think the right way to think about it is pivoting is something you might have to do if you're not doing the right thing. Uh, it's something you should be ready to do, but not, it's not a good thing. And, and the, the goal is to get uh, right, you know, as, as close as you can to the right direction from the beginning. Because every piece of work that you put in, every hour you put into something that you're not using a year or two from now, most of that is basically lost. And uh, you want to get as much of the time and energy you put in into stuff that, that will live on and, and create value for long, you long term. Uh, and you can't do that all the time. You need to be ready to change. But um, I think just the, the attitude is what I'm trying to show. Uh, and then one last just quick topic. Um, so when we, uh, uh, we, we hire a lot of people straight out of school, straight out of you know, undergrad or, or grad school, and um, this is something I, I like to talk to, to people who spend a bunch of time in academia. I think this is mostly targeting 
any of you who are in graduate school in like hard sciences, um, maybe less the MBA folk. Um, but <laughs> Uh, but the, the, the important thing is when someone's coming into a company is that the, one of the most important things is that you're aligned on um, what's, what's the overall goal, like what are we, what are we working towards? Because you, you can try to break down what someone needs to do, but uh, ultimately they need to make decisions for themselves every day, and so you need that kind of high level alignment. Um, so you ask, you know, why do you want to do this? Um, and the good thing is most smart, educated people will answer if you answer, if you ask just broadly, like, what do you want to do, they'll give you some variant of maximize their positive impact on the world. So we're all, like, starting from the same place. Um, but how do you break that? What does that mean, uh, you know, one level deeper? Uh, in academia, impact is, like, how much you advance the state of the art. How much better is the thing you demonstrated from anything that's been done before? Um, that's valuable. That's what you should do in sort of uh, academic uh, type research. Uh, but it's a bit different than what you do in the rest of the world, uh, where uh, impact equals how much better is your thing than what's out there times the number of people who get to use it. Uh, and that's something that's really important to just like think about and, and understand how that changes um, what you do every day and what you value. Uh, because if you make something great but it doesn't get to anyone, it, it doesn't matter. It might as well have never existed at least when it comes to a business. Um, so, yeah, just, uh, just something to think about as you consider moving into sort of private industry. Um, and then the last thing, just to wrap up, uh, we're hiring. Um, we have pretty much every type of job that's out there across every type of marketing, sales, service, business development, uh, every, not every type of engineering, but a lot, software, hardware, materials, polymers, et cetera. And most of the leaders in the company are, have some kind of entrepreneurial background, so we love people who have started or want to start companies. Thank you. Thank you, Max. That was awesome. Um, as a quick reminder, after we wrap up these next nine teams, uh, the judges will go deliberate, and we'll have about 10 minutes of Q&A with Max. So if you have burning questions and you're sitting on the ends of your seats, we will have a chance to ask him then. All right, we are on to our final nine teams of the night. Next up, we have Veritas. If you guys are ready, are you there? Come on up. According to World Bank, there are 500 million smallholder farm households in the world. In India, most of the farmers have only one hectare of land to farm per family. One of these farmers have crop failure. He risks not being able to feed his family, let alone save for the next season. Against such catastrophic risk, you would normally buy insurance. But insurance, while available in the developed world, is not available widely in the developing world. Think about what happens when you lodge a claim with the insurance company. The company sends somebody to check it out. But when you have millions of farmers with less than one hectare of land each, this simply becomes impossible logistically and economically. My name is E.J. Cho. I have 18 years of experience in the insurance industry. I am younger than, older than I look. Um, and uh, I'm working with Mark Jeanette, who just finished his PhD at MIT, looking into remote sensing with monitoring crop. We are Veritas. We are developing a way to estimate crop yield based on aerial image from the plains so that we can develop an insurance product that is affordable for smallholder farmers in order to open up this vast opportunity for the insurance companies. With regular monitoring, we can also detect problems early on, letting farmers know so that they can take action. So we are working to protect the farmers so that they can invest for the better future. Thank you very much. the buyer of your product? So uh, we're going to be operating as a something called managing gen general agency. So that's a servicing, servicing company that will provide uh, underwriting and claims services to insurance companies. So we would act as a, you know, provide the service to insurance companies. And if they don't want the risk, then we can 
basically get the risk capacity from reinsurance companies and distribute it to the, through to the insurance companies who would just take the fee. Have you talked to any insurance companies about the product? It seems like Chubb, maybe? Well, I was a reinsurance underwriter, so um, I, I know the, uh, the, the, uh, the area quite well. I also have an ex-coworker who just set up a new insurance company in Burkina Faso and spoke to him about this product. And he was very interested in um, providing this product because there is something that's called weather insurance right now, which is based on weather uh, rainfall. But it only covers rainfall, so it doesn't cost, you know, cover pest or disease. And he would, you know, the, the reducing that insurance gap is, uh, is a primary focus for us. Do you, have, do you have the data to prove, like, to the actuaries? the value here and do you, what is the value, how yeah. big is the market? I'm an actuary that? as well. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so uh, there are, while they're, um, um, you know, we're in the data collection stage, um, there are numerous literatures right now looking into this. Um, the, basically what's happening is that, you know, the ability to, to predict crop yield based on aerial image, it, you know, is getting better and better. So we're basically researching into this and Mark's come up with a, um, a way of collecting data from the plane so we can collect it on plot by plot basis. So we're going to test out whether that can actually get us to you know, a good enough percentile so that we can um, cover farmers on comprehensive coverage rather than just the rainfall. So it's, not, it's not satellite photos. You're, when you say planes, like you're actually going to fly planes over there. No, we're using aerial imagery from manned aircraft in order to cover enough area. Satellites have a few different issues, including cloud cover and the trade-off between resolution and how often you can update your data. And do you know, like, so what's the cost of covering, like? It comes out to about $1 per hectare. You can cover on the order of 170,000 hectare with one aircraft. What's the time frame for the, what's the time frame of prediction versus how frequently do the consumer interact with the insurance company? That estimate, the, the area coverage is roughly a twice per week update for the crop data. And I'm sorry, I didn't hear the rest of the question. Is it how, you said you're, you're giving better prediction and that informs the insurance decision. That means that the time frame for prediction has to match time frame for insurance derivative decision. Otherwise, you know, you know. I can tell you, it's, it's, gonna, it's, gonna, really it's gonna really shorten the, uh, the notice period. Right now, it's like a year for some of the methodologies. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, great job. Next up, we have Annie Mo. Annie Mo, are you back there? Come on back. There are 11 million people in the United States with tremors caused by Parkinson's disease or essential tremor. Currently, there is no cure for either, but patients can take medication to alleviate their symptoms. However, these medications have harmful side effects and lose effectiveness over time. And when the medication stops working, the next step is invasive brain surgery. There is need for a solution that is affordable, non-invasive, and reliable. And that is where Animo comes in. Animo is a patent-pending therapeutic wristband that stops hand tremors. The device itself is designed to be as simple and easy to use as it is effective. Early user testing demonstrated greater than 95% tremor reduction. We plan to begin clinical trials in parallel with user experience testing so that we can iterate on our device and provide our patients with the most effective solution possible. We are well connected within Boston's Parkinson support groups and expect those patients to be among our first users. When asked how the device made him feel, one patient responded, I feel how I used to feel, like I don't have Parkinson's disease anymore. Join us as we fight to bring this feeling to millions more. So um, who, who pays for this product and how much do they pay? Um, all the parts. Uh, say for the custom PCB are off the shelf. No, I mean in terms of is this, in, is this covered by insurance? Is this out of pocket? So we've determined that we will not need FDA approval, at least preliminarily. Um, and so the average total cost will be very low, limited to the uh, cost of parts, which is also very low. So we can sell direct to the uh, patient. How much will it be? Uh, we haven't done our final design for no, manufacturing yet. Uh, low hundreds. And how does it reduce tremor? 
So the exact biological mechanism is not entirely understood yet. We've consulted with a number of neurologists and who also didn't have a conclusive answer. Um, it, our theory is that it stimulates these uh, proprioceptive neurons in the wrist in such a way that triggers a feedback loop which stops the tremor. Can you make it smaller? Yeah, this is our alpha prototype and is way bigger than it needs to be. How do you think you bring this to market? Um, so we'll initially sell to uh, a small number of patients who we're already in contact with and get their feedback, incorporate that into the next generation of the device, and then um, hopefully go to uh, pre-order, possibly on Kickstarter, so we can start to get it out in much larger numbers. What made you decide to take on this problem? Th this was kind of a something we happened across. Uh, we, we, this was the result of our senior capstone project in mechanical engineering last year, um, in which we were forced to ideate and come up with new possibilities. <laughs> uh, we, we happened to find an idea that worked, and then once we, once we tested it and saw the value that it provided to uh, the people that we tested it on, uh, we realized we had something that we couldn't just give up on. Who is, do you have the IP for this? It's patent Yes, we do, it's patent pending. All right, thank you, Animo. All right, next up, we have Novo Space. Novo Space, are you here? All right, here we go. I'm putting a lot of trust in you right now. Outer Space is open for business. And commercial companies are taking advantage of this by putting up new satellite constellations for applications like real-time video and global internet. And these applications have an increased demand for processing power. However, satellite manufacturers currently face a difficult choice. The first option is to choose a heritage system, which are extremely reliable but often lag decades behind commercial capabilities. For example, the Leon 3 microprocessor, which is commonly used aboard satellites, was first developed in 1997 and last updated in 2010. The second option is to choose a commercial off-the-shelf board, which is not designed to survive the space environment, and these cannot last the durations needed for these new commercial missions. So that's why we created Novo. Novo provides an ecosystem of computing boards, which provide high reliability and high performance power up to 200 times greater than our heritage competitors. Satellite manufacturers will also choose Novo because they can save up to 50% on total costs and up to 50% of development time. Our team can capture this $3 billion, 11% growth market because we have a combined 25 years of experience in the space industry. So choose Novo so we can bring the PC revolution to space. How will these be produced? So right now we're doing contract manufacturing for them, and I think that will probably be how we continue to do them in the future. And what do you expect your margins to be? Uh, margins for this industry are pretty high. We expect upwards of 50%. Um, just to give you an idea, these boards cost uh, about 10 to 15 percent, 10 to 15 thousand dollars to manufacture, and depending on the reliability that you want to institute in your boards, you can charge anywhere from um, 50 thousand to 100 thousand dollars per board. And who's the target buyer? Uh, either subsystem integrators for satellite manufacturers or the satellite manufacturers themselves. Do you have relationships with the buyers? We do. Team? And can you talk about your team? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my team is myself and two electrical engineers who have spent, um, both of them, over 10 years designing these, designing uh, computing boards. And these were born out of their frustration in the current process. And we also have an advisor, Dr. Carrie Cahoy, um, who has a lot of contacts in the satellite industry. And my previous job before LGO was as a consultant in the space industry. So I have a good amount of contacts throughout um, the space industry. What's your competitive advantage in building these boards compared to the other manufacturers that can also you know, move to the next generation of boards and their designs? 
So one thing that we have is uh, we adhere to the Space VPX standards. So these were released about two years ago and these traditional heritage suppliers are not really incentivized to implement these because right now they have all proprietary interfaces. So if you buy their boards, oh, by the way, you have to buy our other products too. So they don't really want to implement Space VPX and we already have it. And I think by creating this ecosystem, this is where defense and government wants to move to because they want more composable systems. They want more modular satellites. They want to plug and play. So we have the uh, capabilities that government wants. We have the reliability that commercial companies need. And we have higher processing power than the uh, heritage companies can provide. What's your revenue now? Our revenue is zero. <laughs> Hard question. Wow. All right. Thank you. Amazing. All right, way to go. Next up, we have AgriLink. AgriLink, are you ready to come on out? Do your thing. You and I might take financial services for granted, but for millions of smallholder farmers around the world, a bank account, not to mention a loan, is completely beyond expectations. In Zambia, where we're launching our pilot, that's five million smallholder farmers without access. But what does that mean for an individual farmer? Well, without access to credit, she can't afford the quality seeds and inputs that she needs. That means every season, she grows less and she's more likely to be trapped in poverty. At AgriLink, we're tackling the two main barriers that prevent banks from working with farmers. The cost and complexity of operating in rural areas and the lack of customer information. And I've seen the impact of these two barriers all around the world. Uh, for the past six years, I've worked to create better financial products for consumers in emerging markets, including farmers in Zambia. And you, drawing on that experience, I've created a two-part service for banks, uh, a network of agents in rural areas combined with a predictive credit scoring algorithm on the back end. This service allows banks to acquire customers and disperse loans at a much lower cost and risk. I'm really excited to announce that right now we're working with the Legatum Center and an international NGO to launch a pilot this spring in Zambia. Four out of five people living in poverty in our world today are farmers. Help us at AgriLink tackle poverty by bringing new innovation to agriculture and financial access to farmers. Thank you. different than some of the mobile money, mobile lending players that are out there today? So we're not doing direct lending. Uh, we are a service that uh, sells to a bank so that they can reach into to new markets and new customers. Um, and we're doing it in a very unique way because we're combining sort of the predictive analytics that goes into a lot of the mobile money, uh, the mobile lending services right now with a uh, on the ground agent network. And so that's a missing piece for a lot of, uh, a lot of those mobile-based lending platforms at the moment. So we have a very low-touch model, uh, which increases the risk of default and, and really also increases the, uh, the risk that uh, negative results of the participating in the credit space for these sort of smallholder farmers, uh, typically less literate in, uh, in financial services. Are the local agents in the, in the, on the ground work for you or work for the, the, work for the bank? The mobile agents, so our network, there's two parts to it. Uh, there's a series of small business owners, uh, the people that interact with the farmers on a you know, weekly basis, the people who sell them their inputs, people who buy their harvest. Uh, they're incentivized to be part of our system through an app based, a smartphone based app. Uh, very low touch for them, but it's an opportunity for them to finance additional sales for their business. And then we hire just a few people on the ground to manage the tech, uh, sort of natural tech challenges that come up with rural operations. Has anyone on your team managed an on-the-ground network of agents before in a rural Sorry? Farm? Has anyone managed an on-the-ground network of agents before in these environments? I've worked in rural operations in agricultural lending and microfinance uh, for about six years. Uh, so I personally have experience, but we also have two partners in Zambia right now, one who's working uh, the rural operations side and another who's had 10 years of experience in microfinance. So uh, very comfortable, and that's part of our sort of value add is that we actually know how to work these things uh, on the ground. 
Do you have any, uh, any partners on the banking side already? So I uh, can't talk about specifics, but I'm working with uh, an NGO right now uh, as an entry point into a relationship with a major bank. Uh, we're hoping to launch the pilot in conjunction with that bank this spring. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. All right. Thank you, AgriLink. Next up, we have Bear Bear. Bear Bear, are you there? All right. Here you go. I'm here to talk to you with you today about a problem that's lurking around our snacks, our water, and those, even those innocent baby carrots. It's plastic food packaging, and it makes up nearly 40% of unrecycled plastic. But here at Bear Bear, we're turning the problem into the solution by making completely edible food packaging out of seaweed and rice. Now, we're hardly alone in realizing that this is a problem. There's edible straws, edible forks, edible wrappers, but how many of you have actually used one of these products? And how many of you use it every day? Not many. <laughs> and that's the challenge. Edible food packaging lacks a durability for everyday use and has not met uh, the mainstream. It needs to be tougher. It needs to be stronger. It needs to work outside, in the heat, in the cold. So who better than backpackers and hikers to prove that edible food packaging can work? And that's our vision here at Bear Bear. We are making meals and snacks wrapped in completely edible packaging that is designed for the trail. As backpackers ourselves, we at Bear Bear know that three things really matter to backpackers when it comes to food. One, is it nutritious? Two, is it environmentally friendly? And three, most importantly, how much does it weigh? And Bear Bear uniquely meets all of these challenges. It means that backpackers and hikers can eat the foods that they love with none of the waste. <laughs> and by proving this in the outdoor space, we can then transform the food packing industry, which is a $300 billion industry. So let's hit the trail and get started. Thank you. So why, why edible and not just biodegradable? What's, I get it, it kind of positions you in a different space, but are there, mm -hmm. are there advantages? So biodegradable, uh, there's a lot of greenwashing happening in this sector right now. And for at least the backpacking space, biodegradable What's greenwashing? I'm not, I'm not oh, in this space. So a lot of um, companies will claim that things are biodegradable or compostable, but even something that's compostable will take time. And especially in the outdoors, you really want something you're not going to, you know, during the summer, there's a bunch of people on the trail seeing still something slowly composting, but it takes six months to a year. It's a couple of the critical, uh, you know, uh, performance features of packaging are to keep the food, you know, clean, sanitary, uh, and um, shelf stable, you know, uh, fresh. Uh, how does your packaging perform along those dimensions? So that's why we're, we're targeting uh, the outdoor sector first. With backpacking food, most of it is designed to be shelf stable because they have to keep it in their packs. So we're starting off with granola bars and um, dehydrated meals. In terms of keeping it hygienic, we're actually uh, boxing it the way that if you think about a Chips Ahoy box of cookies, each of those cookies are not individually wrapped, but they're in a, it's very secure in a box. And we're doing the same thing. In a weekend camping trip, you usually eat maybe six granola bars. So we wrap them in the edible food packaging, but we'll group six together in um, beeswax covering, which is secure, keeps moisture out, and is also um, natural. So do you eat the beeswax packaging? No, no but this no, is no, reusable. No. So we're reducing all the individual packaging that you see in granola bars and dehydrated foods. But um, we're still making sure everything is secure with reusable packaging. So, so are you selling? You're not selling to the food manufacturer. It's almost like an intermediary to group food together. Or like, who are you selling it to? We're to, we're going to sell the meals and the packaging with oh, it okay. uh, because we know that it's really hard. That industry of doing packaging directly is a very thin margin market. Um, it's really hard to be plastic. But if you have good food inside of the packaging, people will eat the food and awesome packaging outside of it. All right. Happy trails, Bear Bear. Thank you so much. Next up, 
We have Love a Bloom. Love a Bloom, are you ready? Let's do it. Hi. We know that children can get addicted to TVs and iPad screens. Well, this screen addiction is much worse than we think. I am passionate about solving this challenge because I have seen little children in my village getting addicted to TVs and iPads. The loop starts with them watching TV, getting poor grades, watching further more TV, and getting further poor grades, and the loop goes on. <laughs> Parents identify this screen addiction as their worst fear, which will impact the parent-child bonding. So what's the root cause of this problem? Well, research at Oxford suggests, number one, every child has a unique rate of learning. Two, when the learning stimulus does not match with this unique rate of learning, the child gets frustrated and seeks active fantasy life, which leads to more screen time. So what's the solution? Well, Mr. Malik from Harvard, having background in education and I in artificial intelligence, have come up with a platform known as Lava Bloom. It helps the child to bloom to his fullest potential and ensures that the love between parent and the child is much stronger. It analyzes the child's facial expressions and voice patterns to come up with this unique rate of learning. It then responds with the content tailored to the needs of that child. It does so in a way which allows parents to be part of the child's imagination experience. So ultimately, it will impact millions of child, children worldwide and across cultures. Please vote for us and ensure, make, make us ensure and help us ensuring that future generations bloom. Let's make a stronger species. Thank you. Um, so what, I, I'm not sure what the product is. Yeah. So the product is more like, uh, it's a voice platform having no screen. Uh, so it's more like uh, Amazon's Alexa, Google, Home Mini. So it, that they are not uh, primary uh, meant for children. And uh, currently, we are devising a product that is meant for children because it takes in the voice patterns along with the facial expressions because children express a lot of their uh, level of understanding through facial expressions. So this is the product which will inculcate all those uh, technologies. So is it a hardware? Yeah, it's a hardware. So we have two revenue streams, the hardware revenue stream and the subscription stream. So the hardware initially will sell the hardware and then we'll subscribe the users so that they can update yearly, uh, so that the content is tailored to their own child. How do you, how do you compete with like the, uh, there is an Echo Dot for kids? Yeah, um, so. I know there's not, they don't have the voice element, the, the facial expression. Facial expression, yeah. Vocal tone. Yeah, so, so we have seen that there is a lot of research currently in MIT Media Labs, which analyzes the child's um, eye, eye tracking moment and analyzes how, what's the rate of reading. In addition to it, there is a lot of companies uh, which we are contacting. Uh, especially reading the facial expressions of a baby. So we are trying to integrate all of the platforms. So in, in facial coding, um, the angle of the coding is really important. Yeah. And so if the child is above or the child is below, yeah. it's going to change everything. Have you been looking at how you're going to deal with it? Yeah, we are trying to uh, get platforms from the rest of the vendors. So currently we are in contact with the vendor that is having like perfection in this technology. So we are trying to buy it from them. We are not building our ourselves. How far along are you in your progress toward uh, We are currently in the integration phase. We are meeting the next vendor next week. And uh, like, uh, I think within three months, we are ready with the prototype. Are you, how are you handling privacy concerns? Sorry? How are you handling privacy concerns with taking pictures of you know, kids all the time and taking them to your cloud? I, uh, I couldn't get your question. How are privacy. you handling privacy MVP. concerns? Um, yeah. So we are trying to sell these products to all the parents. And uh, currently, they're having concerns. So accordingly, this will help them meet those concerns. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Bloom. All right. Next up, we have Leaf Systems. Leaf Systems, are you ready? Good luck. Hi, I'm Julia, the co-founder of Leaf Systems. As the number of physical assets on the market increases, so does the need for an efficient inventory tracking method. The asset management market is expected to reach $25 billion over the next three years. Yet current systems still rely on outdated technology such as barcode readers and cumbersome networks of RFID beacons. 
Large companies are hesitant to adopt new technology because it means tampering with their current infrastructure. Luckily, Leaf Systems has compatible hardware and software components that can be implemented independently. Our patent pending low maintenance hardware platform is capable of centimeter accurate real time location tracking. When launched, LEAF will have a software subscription model for common user applications and data analytics tools. Today, we're partnering with MIT Sandbox and Six River Systems to pilot early iterations of our technology. In the long term, we see LEAF Systems as a game changer in healthcare, robotics, manufacturing, and defense. Please support LEAF Systems, a team of mathematicians and engineers who are striving to make automated inventory localization accessible and affordable. Thank you. You mentioned a couple of different use cases. What use case are you going after first and why? Uh, so our team has significant robotics background, uh, like 18 years total across like four members. Uh, IoT hardware costs are really high, especially with low margins. Uh, so by approaching the robotic standpoint and like data center use, uh, we can keep our margins high and develop really strong software tools to, to aid our hardware platform. So what does an implementation look like? Sorry? What does an implementation look like? You mentioned there's a hardware and a software component. How do I implement that and whatever? Oh, OK. Uh, so our hardware platform, uh, each tag that we can manufacture is about 450 for parts. Uh, mm -hmm. A user would buy a central hub, so it's a little bit beefier piece of technology that integrates with a, a cloud platform and pre-built user applications. Uh, that would be configured with their existing like ROS structure for robotics. Uh, so they would buy a central hub and they could add tags as they go uh, and then pay for enterprise level like subscription models for software. And wh what are the assets in the data center that you're tracking? Uh, so very frequently in data centers, uh, there needs to be an inventory done of the uh, equipment in the data center. Uh, pieces of data center equipment are very expensive, servers, uh, and they actually spend a lot of money uh, right now revamping current data centers with RFID tags. Uh, Impinge is a huge player, uh, multi-billion dollar industry in just revamping data centers with RFID technology. Uh, this doesn't really account for moving pieces of a technology. Uh, people move pieces of equipment in and out. Uh, and it's very inefficient as people have to manually go down the rows and scan uh, every piece of equipment. And so what, what's the value proposition that you would present to a potential data center customer? Uh, in, for in data centers, saved yeah, for, for data centers, uh, it's, it's really manpower and the amount of money it takes to implement that RFID system. Uh, weekly, a person has to go out with uh, portable equipment and scan every single piece of equipment. Uh, with our system, they would install uh, our 50 cent tags because these aren't moving pieces of equipment, we can really drop the costs, uh, and one central hub can account for a 100-meter radius of data center uh, access. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. All right. Two left to go, I believe. Next up, we have retired talent. Here we go. Hi everybody, I'm Felipe from Chile, and I want to tell you about three problems that I want to help solve in Latin America. Of the 50 million retirees, 20 million don't have access to a pension. Many of them are depressed, and one of the main reasons is because they don't feel useful. How will you feel if one of your grandparents were in this situation? Problem number two, since mainly home church services are provided peer-to-peer, there is a, people struggle to find someone to do the dishes or iron the clothes for them. Finally, many people would like to have more free time, but they can't because they need to do the home chores and they don't have enough money to pay for them. Retired talent will solve these problems by providing a marketplace of home chores services that will match customer needs with the best retirees for the job, and also we'll use pricing in order to make home, service, home chores services available to more people that have a lower willingness to pay than the prices that exist today. I want to use my four years of executive positions improving customer experience in the leading airline in Latin America to start this, with this company. 
I'm working with the Sandbox program, and winning this competition will help me to find an MVP to make retired talent real this January. So if you want to improve life quality of retirees, and also from many people that do the home church today, please support my idea. Thank you, my team. Are there any like liability problems with putting old people to work in? in <laughs> oh, sorry? Are there any like liability problems with putting putting the, the elderly to work? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, I need to research how many people of the retirees are able to provide this kind of services. That's one of the first part. I'm just starting with this idea, so I need to investigate that. But there are many there are many retirees that uh, are very bored in, at their houses. They are very capable capable of do a lot of stuff. So they will love to spend more time as they do today working, having time with the friends or, or things like that. They will love to have a source of income to improve their life quality. So as a consumer of the service, um, you know, folks can, can offer all sorts of jobs on other um, apps and pieces of software like I'm, I'll, someone could put their, what they would do for you on TaskRabbit and set their price. Yeah. So why would I go to get with this people from the retired site, why wouldn't I just go and find the right rate and the right job on these other places? Well, at least in Chile, for example, or in other countries of, of Latin America, it doesn't exist something that strong as, as task, task rabbit or handy, for example. So this will be an option for that that doesn't exist today. Um, so if those options come in, how do you compete? Yeah, I think that it will be hard to compete with a big company like that. But uh, I also think that this company have a social dimension that is important that as, as, as someone is willingly to pay more for services that are clean or, or green technologies, I think that this social dimension will help them to invest in this kind of company instead of another ones that provide the same services. How do you think about your marketing strategy to uh, attract the retirees to the platform? <clears throat> Well, uh, I, I need to address first to the sons and daughters of, this, of these parents that from one day to another, they need to assume a bigger cost because their parents were earning money and suddenly they stopped earning money. So I think that is part of my clients and also the nursing homes. I think they have a lot of people that they take care of and they do nothing during the day. So this will be a, another source of clients to provide retirees for this kind of jobs. Great. Oh. Market with, uh, sorry. <laughs> I know. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, Thank you Retired Talent. All right. Give it up for our last team of the evening, number 18, Buddy. Buddy, come on out. Imagine you're in a crunch time at work. You're anxious about your presentation in an hour, but how do you know what will well for you mental wellness at that moment? And if it happens again, how do you prevent it? We all respond to stress and anxiety in different ways. Stress management is a $4 billion market, but existing solutions are neither personalized nor proactive. Buddy is a personalized digital trainer for your mental wellness for young adults. It's a mobile app that tracks indirect indicators of your emotional state like your app usage and location. It will also check in to see how you're feeling. It will use that data to build a personalized model that predict what will impact your emotional state the most. It will then provide tailored content and action plans to help you manage your stress and anxiety in real time. Through Delta V Accelerator this summer, we successfully predicted people's emotional state just by using their smartphone data. Our findings were featured in National Biomedical Engineering Conference and Technology and Psychiatrist Summit in Harvard Medical School this summer. Also, we have started beta testing and have over 300 people on the wait list. We're a team of neuroscientists, psychiatrists, MBAs, and engineers from MIT and Harvard. And together, we're excited and passionate about empowering people, not just manage your stress, but thrive every day. Thank you. One clarifying question here. Um, so is, is, it, is it evaluating your non-Buddy app usage to predict your stress, or is it just evaluating the Buddy app usage? 
Um, so it's looking at your overall, everything that you're doing on your phone. So what apps are you on? Um, include non-buddy apps as well. So like social media, work-related apps, email, thing like that, things like that. Do you think this is going to be regulated like a medical device, or, or what are you thinking? If you're making claims around wellness, you're kind of in the, in the clear. If you're making claims around stress reduction, et cetera, you, you might run into some regulation there. Yeah, we're specifically um, identifying ourselves as away from healthcare as possible so that we don't have to be regulated through FDA. Um, so we're a wellness product that's not diagnosing or treating mental illnesses. We're just addressing stress management. And the specific types of data that we're collecting is just basic data that's captured through the, the phone sensors. So, you know, we're not capturing health-related data. How do you make money? So basic model is through subscription and referrals. So subscription is saying that like B2C model where you're doing monthly or yearly subscription, mm -hmm. but then referrals based on the content that we provide as an action plan. So in case for an example, if we're referring, and as a part of the content that we're referring our users to an app like an Headspace, then we'll collect some sort of a fee of a commission as part of the referral to the Headspace. Will this work without asking questions? Like, will people get value if they don't have to take an active um, input? So initially, we do need some active input. Um, at least to, to be able to like, train or calibrate any model, you need the person to verify that you know, this is how they're feeling or like, whatever you're giving them is actually like, helpful to them or not helpful to them. But the goal is eventually, over time, as you learn, that person, learn about that person even more, the less that they actually need to actively tell you to, uh, to help you out. Do you have any results? Um, so from the R&D standpoint, so what we did is over the summer we ran an IRB approved study in a small scale where we actually collected this data from people's phones. Um, and we were able to build personalized models to predict their emotional state, the fluctuations, and we presented this at a Biomedical Engineering Society conference. Um, and then last week at Technology and Psychiatry um, at Harvard Medical School. All right. Can we get a round of applause for all 18 teams really quickly? Way to go, everybody. Woo -hoo! All right. Thank you all. Judges, I have to ask you to leave the room and go and do your thing. Please, please go and talk amongst yourselves. Uh, when the pitch is over, it is now time for the judges to decide who will win our $5,000 grand prize for this evening. Uh, say goodbye to them for now so they can go and do that. Next up, we also have uh, the audience voting award for your best pick of the evening. Please go ahead, hit up this URL on your phone, and vote for your favorite pitch, all right? Should I just bring Max back up? Yeah, yeah. All right, and last but not least, uh, Max. <laughs> Max, we got to get you back up here, buddy. Sorry. Yep, yep. All right. Everybody, if you haven't voted yet, go ahead and vote again. Think about who your favorite audience choice team is of those 18 teams we just saw. Uh, now we have about, great job. We're going to try to tame this. Now we have about 10 minutes to talk with Max, who is our keynote speaker. Uh, we can take a few audience questions in just a couple of minutes if people are game for it. But in the meantime, Max, I thought it was awesome how you did stick to are people listening? Anyone? No? Should we just do our thing? Uh, I think they'll settle down. They'll in a settle minute. down? Let's just, yeah, let's go All for right. it. Okay, cool. Power yeah? Through. You can't hear me? Or you're voting? The URLs? Hey, 100K. Um, Jake. Is Jake around? That's not working. Yeah, yeah, we don't. Yeah? Okay. We're into it. Okay, they're working on it. If your URL is not working, we are currently working on it. Yes. You have a question for Max? One second. All right, so before we get to audience questions, um, so you left the 100K, you had your business plan, you said you were going to raise $566,000 and get to 1,000 orders within 15 months. Yeah. Dope plan. <laughs> what would you recommend to all of these budding entrepreneurs for like the next three steps when they come out of this competition to actually get their business launched and scaled? So, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so I think um, going back to what I was talking about in the presentation, I'd really kind of separate the question of like, can you raise money? Yeah. Uh, do you have a pitch that will work? Can you go to investors and get it done from 
do we actually have something worth working on? Are we interested in doing this? Do we see a path uh, to go forward? And kind of consider those questions almost separately. Yeah. And, uh, and it's a good time after this to maybe go back, take the input. A lot of the input you get through this process is sort of a mix of like help fundraising, but also business advice. And you have to sort of sort through that and uh, see what did, does this shift how we think about what we should do. Yeah. Um, and uh, and if you're still you know excited about it and want to go forward, then uh, then it's back to work fundraising. <laughs> <laughs> back on the trail. Yeah. Um, excellent. Uh, let's go ahead and ask a question. Uh, can you just speak really loudly and or come down here? Uh, we actually have a mic. Yeah. So where is the question? Up I can't here. see. She's carrying the water Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, so I kind of have two questions. One is related to the limitations of 3D printing in terms of a time constraint. And so I was wondering, as you kind of talk about um, scaling up the cell of the Formlab printers, um, is there any way kind of like render farming to enhance the capacity um, and cut down the timing of that technology? Um, so I'll so I, I'm sorry. I think I'm it's a tech, a it's a, a that's a technical question, right? You basically want to ask, can you, can you repeat it? Yeah, I'm just curious about how you see the limitations of the technology on a commercial scale in terms of the time it takes to actually produce parts. Uh, um, so yeah, some people focus on speed. I, I guess the question is, what about speed in 3D printing? Um, there's a lot of uh, discussion about speed. We have a faster printing technology, et cetera. Um, and speed is one of the performance factors that matter. But the more you talk about high volume production, um, it all kind of boils down to cost. And the way speed factors into cost is reducing the amortized cost of the hardware over time. Uh, so that's really the metric you want to look at. You could make a more expensive, faster printer, or maybe slower, cheaper printer. Um, and you can also address the, the other parts of the cost of printing, which are usually larger than the cost of the printer, the cost of the materials, and the cost of labor involved. Uh, so, so we don't think speed itself is as critical as bringing the overall cost down. Uh, so you have the same um, kind of uh, idea and outlook upon resolution, like voxel printing, things like that, in terms of speed and resolution. Um, you're kind of finding a niche in the, um, yeah, the, the actual in between, as you as you say. I think it was speed versus resolution. So, would you do you think about resolution of parts the same way that you think about speed to produce parts? Uh, no, re resolution is different in that you need. You know, to make a given part, you need to sort of meet the requirements of it. And resolution, material properties, all these other things, it, it's not quite, but in a way, it's kind of a binary thing for a given part. Is, is your technology good enough to make it? So having a higher resolution system lets you make a wider range of parts and address a larger market. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. I actually wanted to ask you something. So everyone knows that entrepreneurship and building a successful business is a shit ton, excuse my language, of execution, a great idea, and then a little bit of luck. I don't know if everyone here has heard this story, but I think it's a great story. Can you tell about your fateful Legal Seafoods uh, experience as yeah. you're getting started? Yeah. So, I, um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, one of the one of the good stories we have from the beginning of um, uh, early days of the company was how we met actually the guy who led our first round of funding. Uh, so we were probably several months post 100K competition. We had, at that point, done dozens and dozens of pitches. We were doing it like every week, just kind of going from, we were interesting enough that people would introduce us to other people, but no one was interested Writing. in investing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we were on that train, and then we had dinner with VC um, at Legal Seafoods in Harvard Square, and it was clear it was not going anywhere like all yeah. of the rest of the pitches. Uh, so we went back to our apartment. Um, I was living with David Craner, my co-founder at the time. And um, late that night, we got an email with a screenshot of a retweet of a tweet. Um, so it's like four <laughs> levels down the chain. And the original tweet was from at M. Caper, who's Mitch Caper, who's uh, um, one of the kind of pioneers of the early days of the PC industry. And it said, on the patio at Legal Seafoods, overhearing two entrepreneurs pitching 3D printing. Uh, and um, we <laughs> Which looked, is dope. Yeah, yeah. That, was, that was dope. And we kind of laughed about it. And um, me being the hyper-rational engineer was like, OK, that you know, funny cool coincidence. What, yeah. <laughs> uh, but luckily, David was like, we should reach out to him. And I said, OK, go for it. I, I don't think anything's going to happen. Um, and he found his email address and emailed him. And he actually, Mitch, responded later that night. And 
He actually said in his first response, um, sounds interesting, but I don't know anything about it, so I wouldn't invest. But, uh, but let's talk next time in town. Yeah. And then next time in town, we chatted with him, and it turns out he decided he, uh, either he does know something about it or he doesn't care, because uh, <laughs> he, uh, he decided to invest. Um, and it's, it's a funny story, uh, but it's also, it was like a really good lesson for me, and especially that it happened early on in the company, because um, I think I and many sort of engineering type people uh, discount the value of sort of um, networking or opportunistic sort yeah. of uh, things like that, but they, they do matter, they are valuable, and you do need to sort of uh, um, make yourself, give yourself opportunities to be lucky or it won't happen. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that the, not exactly a cold call, but uh, networking the crap of, out of a cold call into a warm call is highly, highly effective when you're getting stuff off the ground. I totally agree, yeah. but that's amazing. Um, does anyone else have a question? Yes. Oh. It was quick. Thank you, Max, uh, for your presentation. I have a question. On early stages, when you have just idea, uh, where and how you would find uh, the same believers as you are um, to yeah. proceed this idea to future product? Thank you. So how, when you have an early idea, how do you find the same believers who also believe in your idea? Are you talking about co-founders or investors? Yeah, co-founders, co like someone who would help you with product. Um, yeah, there's no kind of, you know, uh, magic to it other than, you know, look, look in places that, uh, for, first of all, you get out there, do the networking things, call up your friends and family, even if you don't think they're like, luck, likely to be interested or to know someone. Uh, you do have to kind of create opportunities to find that person. Um, but then, you know, think about where are they likely to live today? Uh, uh, like, where, you know, where would this, what companies might this person be in or what programs um, and what other sort of backgrounds are you looking to add to the mix? Uh, but. Yeah, I think a big part of it is you do need to have more opportunities. You're not, this isn't a type of thing where you can precisely find the right person out there. Yeah, totally. Any other questions from the crowd? Anyone? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hold on. Yeah, go for it. Um, so early on, uh, any VC was the, any VC wanted to invest was the right VC. Yes, <laughs> welcome to hardware. <laughs> um, but it, it, we did end up with uh, a couple of uh, uh, really good people who who led our first round of funding. Um, but frankly, we didn't have that much choice uh, in the beginning. So I wouldn't say that we. Were, we were so focused on finding the right VCs. I mean, we were interested in people who either had some you know, big reputation investing or some background in similar technology or something like that. Um, later on, in later rounds of funding, we were fortunate enough to have more choice. Um, and uh, uh, there, you know, I think we, there's a mix of things you look for. Again, you know, this reputation or relevant background or, and all that. Um, I honestly uh, have been pretty paranoid about uh, the kind of uh, impact that investors can have. Uh, so I was kind of more interested in people who would um, believe in sort of a young founder-led company and be ready to sort of go all in on that and be somewhat hands-off. Uh, versus some investors are really looking to get deeply involved in, in a company. So that's one of the things I sort of optimize for. So we have a lot of uh, really um, experienced, successful investors in their own right um, who have their own long careers, and they, they kind of have a more uh, long-term view, I would say, than, than a lot of investors. I agree. All right, we have time for one more question. Anybody out there? Um, it's a good question. Uh, yeah, I think it's a good idea to start a business with your friends. Um, a lot of the, uh, you know, I was close with um, 
my two co-founders at the time and a lot of the other early employees uh, who are still key kind of parts of the team today were also you know, had some fairly close connections with. I think the, um, the important thing to recognize though is that you are entering into a business relationship where if you're both, you know, if everyone involved is really most interested in kind of maximizing the value of that business relationship, that has to work separately from a friend or family type of relationship. You know, family or, or close friends are people that you don't, um, you know, you don't let down regardless of uh, right. the costs or, or whatever. In business, you need the right people in the right place at the right time. Um, and uh, especially if you're in a competitive, fast-paced environment. Uh, and it's hard to know up front who's going to be best at what, and, and people have to be ready for that to evolve over time. Yeah. So I think um, as much as possible having frank conversations and saying, you know, we know it might not work out the way we want it to, uh, that's a great thing. Um, structuring people's relationships with the yeah. company in, in a way. Oh, sorry, gotta wrap up, sorry. We're getting um, the boot, sorry, Max. Vesting over time <laughs> so that if people leave, it's okay, that's a good thing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> thank you, right. thank you so much, Max. Thank you, thank, thank you. you. All right. It is now time to find out the winners. I would like to invite Sandy and Jake back to the stage to Woo. announce who they are. Woohoo! Okay, we have our winners. But before we announce our winners, we want to take one quick minute and thank the leadership committee. And I'm going to do this embarrassing thing. Everyone from the leadership committee can stand up, and whoever is hiding behind the scenes can come this way. So please join us in a huge round of applause. This. This group of people, beyond having to execute events like this, is also taking on the challenge of revamping the 100K for its next 30 years. And as Sandy and I officially uh, transition out of this event, having worked with this group on this event, we're entirely confident that they're going to come up with something that's significantly better than we could have ever imagined. So please join us one more time in giving them a huge round of applause. So without further ado, um, the Audience Choice Award goes to Animo. Come on down, come on. Judges, you want to get in on this? All right, smile at our photographer here. Congratulations, you take the chance. Sign something to actually get your money. So just go down. <laughs> okay, and now uh, I do want to take the time to acknowledge and thank our judges once again. So thank you for being here and for your work. And and also give a big round of applause to Do to Dolce, who was a great MC tonight for us. And that being said, this was a tough decision. Don't let me lie. Uh, but we have our pitch grand prize, and the winner is Novo Space. Woo! Come down. Yeah, Jenny! Judges, please again. Okay. 
With that, everybody, that's the end of the show. Thank you so much for coming. Please look out. Accelerate Applications will be opening soon. It's going to be a big year. Thank you all.